Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that is very disturbing and uncomfortable and I'm actually really surprised that I haven't heard more about this case until someone went to my email and suggested that I cover it. I didn't want to cover this case at first and I kind of went back and forth with whether I wanted to talk about this case but I think this is a very interesting case despite how disturbing it is so I did decide to go ahead and cover it here on my channel. But before we get into the video, I just wanted to go ahead and say a big thank you to today's sponsor, Birch Living. As we all know, sleep is a vital part of our health and well-being. As a healthcare student, I place a huge emphasis on getting a good night's sleep and getting a good quality of sleep to stay healthy and live your life to the fullest. Birch Living makes organic, non-toxic mattresses that are made in the U.S. with four materials made from nature. Organic latex, zealand, wool, American steel springs, and organic cotton. As you guys have heard me talk about in other videos, it's really important to me that I live my life the most sustainably that I can and do my best to use organic and natural materials whenever I can. And that is why I love Birch mattresses. Not only is their mattress made from natural, non-toxic materials, but it's also incredibly comfortable and comes with two breathable eco-rest pillows made from recycled plastic bottles. Now, anyone who knows me in real life knows that I have some gnarly sleeping problems. I have spent so many nights, more than I would like to admit, going to bed at like 10 or 11, but somehow I end up staying up until 4 a.m. because I just can't sleep. I just end up tossing and turning and just being up all night and that doesn't really work when I have to be up the next day at 7 a.m. for school and use my brain power and take exams and work with patients. I honestly have never even considered the comfort of my mattress until I switched to Birch. I'm only 23 years old so I've always just bought the cheapest mattresses without a second thought but I now realized how important it is to invest in a good quality mattress. I never even thought that my sleeping problems could be due to an uncomfortable mattresses but let me tell you, after switching, I get a much better night's sleep. Now, buying a nice mattress might be intimidating, but Birch makes it very easy. You just go to their website and buy it online and it's shipped and delivered straight to your door for free anywhere in the US. It comes rolled up in a box and it's honestly pretty easy to set up all by yourself. If it makes you a little bit nervous to buy a mattress that you haven't tried out yet, Birch has you covered with their 100 night sleep trial. You get over three months to sleep in that mattress and make sure you love it. And if for some reason you don't, they'll pick it up for you and give you a full refund. Plus you get a 10 year warranty on the mattress if you do decide that you love the mattress, which I think you will. Honestly, Birch makes it really easy to go ahead and give their mattress a try. I love my new mattress and I honestly think that you will too. The exciting news is that if you go ahead and click the link down below in my description box or head over to birchliving.com slash Rachel Shannon, you can get $200 off of your mattress plus two free pillows. It's never been easier and more convenient to invest in better sleep and better health. Thank you again to Birch for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. It's honestly such a wild ride, so let's just jump right in. Now, this case starts in 1995 when a 20-year-old man named Steve Platel went online and met a 15-year-old teenager named Alyssa on the internet. At the time, Steven was living in New York City while Alyssa was from San Antonio, Texas. The two chatted online for a while, sending messages back and forth. They wrote each other love letters and even visited each other in person a couple of times before Stephen actually convinced Alyssa to leave her life in Texas to go move in with him in New York. So she did that and it wasn't long before Alyssa was 16 years old and she found herself pregnant. By January of 1998, she went on to give birth to her daughter, who she named Denise. At this point, Alyssa was 17 years old. She had a daughter who she absolutely loved and adored, but she was away from her family and things just weren't easy for her. Alyssa tried her best to try and make the best life possible for her daughter, but Stephen made that absolutely impossible. He was incredibly abusive towards both Denise and Alyssa. He would pinch Denise until her skin was just purple and black and 
and blue. When she would cry, there were times that Stephen would just lock her in a cooler so that he could go away and not hear her. Sometimes he would even cover her mouth while she was crying to the point of almost suffocating her. And Alyssa did try to help her daughter, but whenever she did, Stephen just would not let her. He physically stopped her from helping her daughter. It was very clear that Alyssa was very scared of him and she didn't want to be in this situation, but Stephen would threaten her and tell her that if she ever tried to leave him, he would take his own life. He had also been very cruel to animals right in front of Alyssa, so she knew that he was very capable of being violent. Also, throughout their entire time together, Stephen wouldn't get a job and he left Alyssa with the sole responsibility of raising their daughter, having a job and making money, and taking care of him even though he was an adult and she was still technically a child. It got to the point where Alyssa knew that she needed to remove her daughter from the situation. She thought that if she didn't act soon, that Stephen was going to kill Denise. So she did what she thought was best for her and she put up eight-month-old Denise for adoption. She just wanted to give Denise the best life that she possibly could and she thought that this was the best decision for her. Denise ended up being adopted by Tony and Kelly Fusco. They took her home to Dover in New York, which was around 80 miles north of New York City and raised her alongside their biological son, Carrie, as well as other biological siblings. They renamed Denise to Katie Fusco, and by all accounts, they gave her a great life. They lived in a small trailer park community that was described as a sleepy town with a lot of good people and families. The community did have their problems, but overall, it seemed like a pretty decent environment for her to grow up. Neighbors around the community also commented and said that the Fusco family just seemed like your average family. Katie was described by her friends and family as a reserved, shy, yet happy girl. She absolutely loved animals and she was passionate about them. She was a vegetarian and was a foodie who was always eating. She went to Dover high school and was on the cheerleading team. She was also known by her peers for her artistic ability, specifically with drawing comic strips. Katie absolutely loved art and had planned to attend college and eventually pursue a career in digital advertising. She once wrote in a blog post, a pen and something to draw on became a safe place for me. Ink became my weapon against rules and regulations. There wouldn't be a corner in a classroom or a park that I didn't have a little secret character living on it. Ask an artist why creating is important to them and they won't ever stop giving out reasons. To be short, for me, a life without art is no life at all. Now, according to the Fuscos, Katie did know that she was adopted growing up. She never seemed bothered by the fact that she was adopted, but of course, she was always curious curious as to who her biological parents were. Now, Alyssa and Stephen, Katie's biological parents, did end up staying together despite the stress and the problems that they had. I don't know if things in the relationship ever really got better at any certain points, but as we will kind of see throughout this case, it does seem like Stephen just has a way of intimidating women and making them stay. Either way, in 2007, Stephen and Alyssa had their second daughter. This time, Alyssa said that they were much more grown up and they were in a stage in their lives where they were much more ready and prepared for a child. Then, in 2012, they gave birth to their third daughter, and of course, these two other daughters they did end up keeping. So, by the time Katie was 18 in 2016, she set out to social media to find her biological parents. She did end up finding them, and so she sent them a message on Facebook, and they were actually really happy to hear from her, and they welcomed her with open arms. She was actually supposed to attend college in August of that year, but she had just grown so close with her biological parents through her time that she had spent messaging them that she decided that instead of going to college, she was going to move to Henrico County, Virginia, in with Alyssa and Stephen. Now, of course, Katie's adoptive parents, Kelly and Tony, weren't too sure about her decision to go and move in with them, but they thought at this point she was old enough to make her own decisions, so they reluctantly let her move in with them. By the time Katie joined her biological parents in their home, her two younger sisters were 11 and 6 years old. They were incredibly happy to have Katie move in with them in the home, but things between Alyssa and Stephen weren't so great. 
Stephen and Alyssa had started sleeping in separate rooms, and shortly after that, Stephen and Alyssa did decide to separate from each other. Alyssa said that they were at a point in the relationship where she had just decided that enough was enough. She said that she had suffered a lot of emotional abuse over the years at the hands of Stephen. She said that living in the home with him was like constantly walking on eggshells. If he was in a bad mood, everyone else around him had to suffer the consequences. He would even yell at her and break things in front of their two daughters. There was honestly a lot of uncomfortable tension in the house, so it honestly kind of makes me wonder why they let Katie come in and live with them in the first place. It just makes me question why if Alyssa knew how Steven acted in front of her and their daughters, why they would let Katie come back into that situation. To me, it seems like Steven was maybe the one who was more interested in letting her come back and maybe they both honestly wanted to get to know Katie and they thought that, you know, she could come in and maybe things would be okay with her even if things between Steven and Alyssa weren't so great. I honestly don't really know, but it does make me question why they wanted Alyssa to come live with them so bad. But Either way, when Katie was living with them, Alyssa found a moment to kind of pull Katie aside and explain to her why she was put up for adoption. Alyssa told her that Stephen had abused her as a baby and that she was worried for her safety, so Alyssa thought that putting her up for adoption was what was best for her and she knew that living with a different family would have given her the best life possible. Naturally, of course, Alyssa was sort of expecting this intense reaction from Katie as anyone would hearing this kind of news. But to Alyssa's surprise, Katie honestly didn't really have much of a reaction at all. She wasn't really concerned with any of this and she wasn't afraid of Steven at all. In fact, the two got along very well. It really seemed like the two had bonded during her time living there and things were going really great for Katie and Steven. However, around two months after Katie moved in with them, Steven's behaviors started to change. All of a sudden, he was this man in his 40s wearing skinny jeans and skin-tight t-shirts. He shaved off his beard and let his short hair grow all the way down to his shoulders. He opted for this new style that better matched Alyssa's, whose was a little bit darker and edgier. Then, Stephen decided that he was going to start sleeping on Alyssa's floor in her bedroom. Now, this behavior did not go unnoticed by Alyssa. She immediately saw what was going on and she immediately wanted to put a stop to it. After the second night that Stephen went in to sleep in Alyssa's bedroom, Alyssa confronted him. He asked him, of course, what he was doing and why he was sleeping in there and said that it's just not appropriate. But this turned into a heated argument and Stephen told Alyssa to mind her own business and then he just stormed out of the house, taking Katie with him. By November of that year, Alyssa had just had enough of him and she finally moved out of the house. They were, I think, legally separated. I'm not sure if it was legally separated or if they were just saying that they were separated, but they weren't divorced yet at this point. So Alyssa shared equal custody with Stephen of their two children, but she did take the two children with her to live with her in her new house. However, Katie decided to stay back and she continued living with her biological father. And this is when the case gets very, very disturbing. Around six months after moving out of the home with Stephen, Alyssa learned of the very disturbing relationship that Katie and Stephen had. One night, Alyssa was reading her 11-year-old daughter's journal, and she happened upon a page where she wrote that Stephen had told her to stop calling Katie her sister and to start calling her her stepmom. She had also drawn a picture of a girl who was supposedly Katie with a big pregnant belly. I do have a picture of this journal journal entry, but it's honestly difficult to read, so I will do my best to read a couple of sections. So it says, but now she is pregnant and gained weight and my dad calls her baby also his baby. Did he make her pregnant? My dad even says she's my stepmom. WTF. He doesn't even want me to call her sister, but Katie is my sister. She probably is his wife now. 
but in nature, she's only my sister. Does she see me as a daughter or a sister? Alyssa was absolutely frantic and hysterical after reading this, so she immediately called Stephen and asked him if Katie was pregnant with his child, and he said yes, she is. He was totally casual about the entire thing and said that the two were in love and that he thought that she knew about it. Katie and Stephen had started their sexual relationship as soon as Alyssa had moved out, and the two had plans to get married as soon as him and Alyssa had divorced. Katie's sisters had also said that when they would sleep over at Stephen's house that they did see Alyssa and him sleeping in the same bed. And they said that Stephen told them not to tell any of their friends about Katie and his relationship, saying that their friends would make fun of them if any of them found out. Of course, Alyssa tried processing all of this, but holy cow, I cannot imagine what was going through her head when she was finding all of this out. She started cursing at Stephen, saying that he was sick, that she's just a child, your child. And also, of course, she immediately called police. Police arrived and interviewed Stephen, Alyssa, and the two girls, but at the time, no arrests were made. Also, around this time, Alyssa and Stephen had finalized their divorce, so Katie and Stephen had packed up and moved to Nightdale, North Carolina. By July of 2017, Stephen and Katie applied for their marriage license. Of course, they lied on the application and didn't mention the small minor fact that they were related and that they were father and daughter. So by July 20th of 2017, Stephen and Alyssa got married in Parkton, Maryland in a small lakeside wedding. They were accompanied by Tony and Kelly, Katie's adoptive parents, who smiled alongside the couple as they tied the knot. Stephen's mother was also present at the wedding. Apparently, Tony and Kelly thought that there was nothing that they could do to stop the two from getting married, so they thought that it was best to just put all of their emotions aside and support their daughter through whatever she was doing. I do wonder if they even tried to do anything though, like did they even try to talk her out of it? Clearly, Stephen had a lot of power and control over Katie, and she was probably in a very vulnerable place by the time she went over to go meet her biological parents. She was happy to finally meet the people who gave birth to her. As an adopted child, I'm sure she's always just had the thought looming over her of who her biological parents possibly were. I'm sure that she always wondered what they looked like, what they acted like, what their life was like. Then she met them and they accepted her with open arms. Steven seemed like this amazing guy who was doing everything that he could to try and get to know her and try to impress her. He even changed his image to look exactly what he knew that Katie would like. I imagine he probably gave her everything that she wanted and more. I'm sure that he kissed the ground that she walked on and groomed her until she absolutely fell for him. To her, she didn't know this man. She had just met him, and when you meet someone who definitely does not act like a father and only acts like a friend or a lover, it's probably very confusing. She probably did not see him as being related to her, but as a father, Stephen saw her being born. He abused her tiny little baby body to the point where her own mother didn't feel comfortable or safe for her being around him. He knew that she was his daughter and he was in a position to control her in any way that he saw fit, and to me, this is how he took advantage of her and just ran with it. By September 1st, 2017, Katie gave birth to their baby boy, who they named Bennett. They lived in a home in a cul-de-sac in a suburban area, and things seemed to be going great. But by January of 2018, police showed up on their front door and arrested the both of them for incest, adultery, and contributing to the delinquency of a minor. After appearing in front of the judge, the two were released on bail. Stephen's lawyer claimed that there were absolutely no allegations allegations of Stephen pressuring Katie into this relationship. He said, quote, this is a case of an 18-year-old girl who shows up at the doorstep of a 40-year-old man who's going through difficult times with his wife. They have a bond because they're biologically related, but they never knew each other before they had a sexual relationship. He was head over heels in love with her, so much so that that outweighed the issue of them being biologically related. But then, after the two were released, Katie went home to live with her biological parents in New York. They were ordered to have absolutely no contact with each other, and little Bennett was handed over to Stephen's mother. At this point, Stephen was starting to show his unstable and aggressive side more and more, and Katie started to want out of the relationship. So, in April of 2018, Katie 
got into contact with Stephen despite their no contact order. She wanted to talk to him and break it off with him for good. And this is what set off the catalyst of the tragic events that would happen next. On April 11th, Stephen went to his mother's house to pick up Bennett and brought him back to his own home. As we would later find out in a frantic 911 call placed by Stephen's mother, once he brought seven-month-old Bennett home, he took his life most likely by suffocating him. We don't know the exact cause of death as far as I have seen. I don't think they ever released it, but we would later find out that he had no visible signs of trauma on him when they did the autopsy, so it is believed that he most likely was suffocated. After this, on April 12th, he left his home and drove around 500 miles north to Wingdale, New York, where Katie lived. He got a minivan and went to the local liquor store, where he sat and waited and watched Katie and Tony leave their home. At this point, Katie and her dad were on their way to Katie's cleaning job at her adoptive grandmother's house. As Katie and Tony drove away from their home, Stephen followed them from Wingdale to New Milford until they got to a stop sign at the intersection of Route 7 and 55. Just minutes later, witnesses called police reported seeing someone open fire on two people. Stephen Platel had pulled up next to their truck and fired several rounds from his rifle, which was similar to an AR-15, into the passenger side of the truck. Both Katie and Tony had suffered multiple gunshot wounds to their upper torso and heads. After he shot the two at around 8.45 a.m., he called his mother and reported that he had killed Katie, Tony, and their seven-month-old baby, Bennett. So, of course, after receiving this call, Stephen's mother called 911. In the call, she said, quote, my son just called me and told me that he killed his baby. I just got off the phone a couple of minutes ago and he told me to call police that I shouldn't go over there. He said he put a key under the front mat, a key into the house. His wife broke up with him over the phone yesterday. He killed his wife. He killed her father. Three nine one one, add us to the emergency. Yes. Um, uh, my son just called me and uh he told me he oh my god. Uh he killed his, his baby and he's in the house. Okay, you said that he told you he killed his baby. <laughs> okay, ma'am, listen to me. What's your name? Okay, um, what's your home address? Um, I'm not there. That's okay. his house. Okay, what's his address? Okay, tell me exactly what happened. Uh, he, he's, I, he's, he's not home. His wife broke up with him over the phone yesterday. And he told me, she's in New York, and he told me he was on his way. He called me last night and said he's on his way. He's going to bring the baby to her and then he was coming back and he just, he just okay. he said he doesn't have he killed his wife he killed her father and he I can't even believe this is happening okay. and did this happen in Nightdale uh, no the, the, the his wife and father are in New York Okay, and, so the but, incident but actually... he left. He left the baby dead when he left. Okay, he where did with. where did he leave the baby? Okay, he said it was in the. What's his last name? <laughs> Same as mine. When did oh, it happen? He said he left last night. He called me. I think at maybe about seven last night and said he was on his way to New York. He was going to bring to his wife and given to her and then he'd be back and and he called me this morning I, I just got up the phone just a couple of minutes ago and he told and I oh god he told me to call the police that I shouldn't go over there okay so the son is uh, so your son is not there no though the house is empty the, oh he said he put a key under the front mat to take a key to get into the house under the front mat. Did he say how oh he did it? Or what no, he did? and I, I didn't ask him. I didn't ask him. I didn't want to know. Oh my God! He's such a wonderful little. Boy. Okay, hold, hold hold on just a second, okay? <laughs> oh my God. 
When police arrived, both Katie and Tony were dead and their truck was absolutely covered in bullet holes. When police went to Stephen's home, police did find baby Bennett's body in Stephen's closet and he too was unfortunately dead. Then they started their manhunt to find Stephen, but this did not last long as they found him pretty quickly. At 9.15 a.m. that same day, police in Dover found Stephen's minivan. He was inside in the driver's seat, slumped over, and he too was dead. He had shot himself inside of that car, taking his own life after taking the life of both his son and his daughter and the man who adopted her. So, that is pretty much where the case ends. Alyssa has come out and talked a lot about this case, and obviously this entire thing was incredibly traumatic for her and her children. She had said that throughout her entire time knowing Stephen, he was physically and verbally abusive, but he was never sexually abusive towards any of their children. So she never expected him to be involved in any sort of relationship with his child. However, we do know that when Stephen was 20 years old, he groomed a 15-year-old girl into having a relationship with him and giving up her whole life and moving in with him in New York over a thousand miles away from her family. She had also said that he had always shown an interest in collecting guns. She said that he had a closet full of guns and would often threaten her with violence as we know. She said that after leaving him, she would pull up to an intersection and if someone had slowed down next to her or stopped next to her, she was always paranoid that it was him showing up to harm her. So when Stephen was originally arrested for incest, they did see his guns, but Alyssa said that she thought that it was possible that maybe Stephen used her information to buy himself a gun online, or maybe he built one himself, since according to her, he is a very talented carpenter. But either way, Alyssa believes that he felt that all he had left in his life was Katie and Bennett. She had said that he could always hold on to the hope that, you know, one day Katie and him would be back together and they would have Bennett and they would be a family. But once Katie made it very clear that that wasn't going to happen, he snapped and decided that nothing was worth it anymore. If he couldn't have them, then no one could. He couldn't live without her, and she didn't want her living without him. It's just so disturbing and unfortunate that it all happened this way and how this entire thing played out. So this does bring up the last bit that I want to talk about in this video. Obviously, this was a very disturbing case, and pretty much everybody watching this would be disgusted at the thought of all of this. But one idea that did get brought up with this case was the idea of genetic sexual attraction. It's basically an attraction that develops between blood relatives who meet for the first time as adults. This is a rare thing, but there have been several cases of relatives wanting to be together after reconnecting as adults. It's really bizarre, and it makes me question, is this something that's common between people who met and don't know their relatives? Or, you know, is it more common with people who know their relatives and just meet up after a while? Because I guess if you don't know your relatives, it's understandable. But I obviously think that if you know your relatives, it makes it a lot worse, especially for Steven seeing his daughter being born and wanting a relationship with her. It's just so disturbing. I do personally believe that Steven did a lot to pressure Katie into this. It may not have been him overtly pressuring her, but it was definitely him covertly pressuring her. He changed his entire image to fit what he knew Katie would like, and he inserted himself into her life in a very inappropriate way. I know that Katie was a legal adult and Obviously, she took part in this relationship too, but I have a lot more sympathy for her. I can't even imagine how confused she must have felt through all of this, especially meeting this man who was supposedly her father, who was all of a sudden just acting this way towards her. It must have been so confusing to her, and I think she sort of fell into this relationship and thought that she was in love with him. But as soon as she was separated from him and living back with her parents, realized that this was wrong and realized that she maybe was not in love with him and that's why she wanted to break it off with him. And that is ultimately what cost her and her son's life. This is just such an unfortunate case and it was definitely preventable and it's just really sad and unfortunate how all of this played out. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. I'm really looking forward to hearing all of your guys' thoughts in the comments. Do you think that Katie was pressured into this or do you think that she took part in this willingly? Please let me know what you think in the comments below. 
If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and click the link down below or go to birchliving.com slash Rachel Shannon to get $200 off of your mattress plus two pillows for free. Don't forget to follow me on my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over in an email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!